Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Weil. Today, I have Jeff Ford on from Be Strong Physiotherapy up at Moffat Beach on the sunny Sunshine Coast. How are you, Jeff? Good, Andrew. How are you, mate? Very well. Um, I've really underprepared here. I haven't written up a bit of a spiel about you as a clinician, so I must apologize. You've been on the podcast a couple of times in a roundtable situation, so I only just realized that I wasn't going to pump your tires up and tell everyone your story. I, I kind of prefer it that way. So it's all, it's all good. Well, I'll pump your tires up this way. Your Instagram, I think, is probably in the top five best physio Instagrams online at the moment. So there you go. Thanks, Legend. Appreciate that, mate. So everyone <laughs> out there, follow Jeff. Speaking of, what is your handle on Instagram, mate? Handle? I think it's just bstrong.physio. But if you type in Be Strong Physio, you should um, you should see my my mug pop up. You haven't got anyone claiming it's Jeff Ford at the moment because you've got so many followers. People just oh, no, no one's hit me up with any of that sort of stuff, no. like trying to sure yeah, get me to pay them large sums of money or anything. <laughs> All right, we're going to go with some quick fire questions to start with, and then we'll ju- jump into it. Now, today we are talking all things ACLs and. We're talking whether an ACL can heal or not, what we should do going forwards. You absolutely were hammering out the ACL content at the end of last year Mm. and I was loving it. So let's dive into it. So this is a yes, no, or maybe, and then we'll just jump into why and we'll just see what happens. Do too many people have ACL surgery for complete ACL ruptures? Yes. Can a completely ruptured ACL heal without surgery? Yes. Can some completely a completely ruptured ACLs heal without surgery and without using a bracing protocol? Yes. Is accelerated ACL surgery consistent with reducing the incidence of future meniscal tears compared to delaying surgery? No. Yep. Does ACL surgery reduce the chance of further knee damage compared uh, to no surgery? Uh, no. Is there any evidence that early ACL surgery is superior to exercise rehabilitation with an option for surgery in the future? No, not good evidence. Does surgery for ACL ruptures reduce the incidence or severity of osteoarthritic change compared with no surgery? No. Last one. Is ACL surgery for a completely ruptured ACL a further trauma or injury to the knee? Yes. It is. Nice, mate. There we go. Very good. Let's start at the top. You said after the question, do too too many people have ACL surgery for a completely ruptured ACL? You said, yes, there are too many people Mm -hmm. going under the knife. Why is that the case? And you'll probably segue into the next question, which was you said, yes, a completely ruptured ACL can heal without surgery. Yeah, absolutely. So... I guess it, historically, it's it's always been assumed that ACLs can't heal up until very recently. And for that reason, um, partly for that reason, we, we've thought that we've needed to, to stabilize the knee by, by going in there and doing an ACL reconstruction. So especially in, in some of the jurisdictions like Australia and the US, the, the default has always been you do your ACL, you go straight and get your ACL reconstruction done. Um, but there, there was probably a lack of evidence about whether that, that approach was actually effective. It was just assumed to be effective rather than actually going back and testing, hey, is this actually more effective than not having surgery or other forms of treatment such as exercise-based interventions? So... Um, for that reason, it, there is a huge, there are a huge number of people that go and get um, ACL reconstructions uh, as soon as they have their ACL ruptured. However, the the evidence is the the, the high quality evidence. So, to you've got to make your, your your judgments based off the best available evidence, and the, the probably the only two high quality studies, randomized controlled trials, are consistently sort of saying that we should be that exercise-based rehab with the option for delayed surgery is just as effective as as early surgery. 
So we should be giving more people the opportunity to at least explore not having surgery straight away, and therefore potentially avoiding surgeries. Um, and then there is also this emerging evidence even even more recently now. So part of part of that has come out of this Canoon trial, which is one of the the high quality randomized controlled trials. Is it Canoon or Canon? Uh, I believe it's Canoon. Really? Because <laughs> it's, it's it yeah. just looks like Canon. Canon. To me. Yeah, I think that's us Aussies versus the um, the Swedes, the, yeah, the right. Scandinavians. Canoon. Canoon. I think it's just a, it's just an acronym. Sure. Let's uh, let's go with Canoon. Um, but yeah, so it, um, some of the secondary analysis done by, um, Steph Philbay and colleagues has shown that there, there is, um, a proportion of people who didn't get early surgery, um, have gone on to have their ACLs healing. And the ones that, ones that did heal seem to have had report, reported better patient outcomes versus the people that either didn't heal or went on and had the early ACL reconstruction, which is really interesting. And then, yeah. um, as you know, there's the uh, there's the cross bracing protocol, which has come out more recently, which has got some really really promising results in terms of of um, facilitating a really high percentage of people um, going on to have a healed ACL. Yeah, and some of the stats from that RCT, the Canoon or mm. Canon, if you're an Aussie. Uh, I've got them down here. So 50% of people that didn't cross over to surgery had proof of healing on MRI. Yeah. One third of all participants that were not randomized to early surgery showed MRI evidence of healing. So they were doing nothing to facilitate healing, no brace, mm. nothing. And the ACL healers, they had better outcome scores than those that who had rehab without yeah. surgery, um, oh, sorry, without healing or surgery. So um it's phenomenal what they're doing it's it's great mm -hmm. but what surprises me is it's taken this long for us to start looking at this further because i had justin Rowe and tim musgrove on and we chatted about the fact that even back in 1994 there was that paper by ihara that showed that there was mm -hmm. an ability for the acl to heal spontaneously and then fujimoto in 2002 and then costa in 2012 i still feel like it's taken too long don't you Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, you can sort of, you can hypothesize about some of the reasons for that, but I just think it's just such a norm in our society, isn't it? To, to get your ACL done. It's all over the media. As soon as a footy player goes down with an ACL, it's like, all right, we know they're back in like nine to 12 months once they've had their surgery and, and rehabbed it. So it's, yeah, there's, there's probably, it's probably multifactorial why it's taken mm. so long, but yeah, absolutely. It's, it's super slow, but even now, I don't know if you're experiencing it. There's so much pushback against this stuff. Yeah. And are you finding that that pushback is from surgeons or is it, or is it clients as well? Yeah. I mean, it's not directly always from surgeons, um, but it's it's yeah it's what it's the messaging it's probably the messaging that that clients and clients patients are, are receiving when they go for these things and they might have already had a chat to me and then they go to the the surgeon and the surgeon kind of rubbishes you know some some of that evidence um, or the other way around they've already been to the surgeon and the surgeons you know told them that they've got to rush in and have the ACL done ASAP because if they don't they're risking having further damage and those sorts of things, which just don't seem to be supported by the evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And what, cause you have had a patient recently that's done the cross bracing protocol and she had an amazing result. Yeah. What's your experience with the cross bracing protocol and while we're there, just describe to the, for the listeners, what the bracing protocol is um, yeah. and what its goal is. Yeah. Awesome. And, and thanks publicly, mate, for, for referring me to, to have a chat to, to Dr. Tom Cross as well. That was, um, that was awesome. I messaged Andrew and said, Hey, I've got someone who's just done their ACL. Uh, what's this cross bracing protocol? And he, um, he put me in contact and, and Tom very kindly um, took this, this lady on and um, yeah, she was, she was super stoked in the end, had a, had a complete heal of a completely ruptured ACL, which is pretty amazing. So um, the, the protocol, I don't want to do it disservice by describing it wrong, but the protocol as she went through it was you get put in a 90 degree brace for, for four weeks. 
And then essentially you are, you, they gradually increase that range of motion up until about the 12 week mark where they come out of the brace, go and get a repeat MRI to see whether, you know, whether it's healed and the, the extent of healing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a big undertaking. I've had a lot of people sort of contact me um, via social media and say, oh, I don't think anyone would ever do that. Why would you ever do that? It sounds way too hard. But I think the outcome of it compared to surgery is, is pretty amazing. And, um, you know, this, this lady in particular was, she was very hesitant at first. She was, she's got like four, three or four kids and, um, she was, you know, worried about having to, you know, limp around cause you, you can't put your foot on the ground. It's been 90 degrees. So you literally can't walk. So you're on crutches or a, or a scooter. And, um, she was definitely apprehensive about that at, at first, but she messaged me at the end and, and said how thankful she was because she was so happy that in hindsight that she had done it. Um, and, and obviously had a good outcome, but it, but it seems like the people who, who go into this protocol, they, they select them fairly carefully. So to ensure that they are good candidates, but the, the stats are pretty amazing coming out of that. And, um, I think there will be, obviously not everyone is going to, going to elect for this, um, this sort of protocol, but I think there will be a lot of people that at least want to explore it, having to, you know, potentially, potentially don't have to go through surgery and, and the rehab and having that further trauma to their knee. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I agree. It's not for everyone. And I had mm. a mate do it last year and he was hating it, <laughs> absolutely hating it. And even when we had a reunion for our school mid last year, and he was on crutches at the time with the knee and a brace and a couple of the lads there that had played rugby union were giving not only me shit, but him shit for trying something different. Wow. You know, they were like, oh, you should have just gone off and had surgery. What what would you know and all this? And and at after coming out of the brace, he had great a great healing response. And he's super thankful now that we tried to get him to go down that path. And what he did with Tom was exactly what I would have done in his shoes for sure. But yeah, it's not for everyone because that first six weeks is non-weight bearing. So you got six weeks of crutches. Mm. You've got to keep the brace on that whole time. You've got to keep it on even or you in a shower, you have to keep it on or you sit down in a chair, take it off, sit in the chair, wash your leg, then put it back on to keep the knee at 90 in those first four weeks. Yeah, it's a, it would be an absolute punish. And even just like for people that say sleep on their stomach or their back, yeah, um, you know, that'd be hard. So for me, on- I... I sleep on my side, so I feel like I do okay if I put like a pillow between my knees or something like that. But um, I can understand people's hesitancy with it because of the the brace. Like that would do my head in. And for you and I, it'd make work pretty damn difficult, wouldn't it? Mm. Oh, impossible, really. Well, not impossible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really like- impact because you've got to be able to demo all the exercises and movements, and yeah, it, it would make it super difficult. And you're obviously on, I was going to mention, you You have to go on anticoagulants as well, yep. which is, is to, to prevent any blood clots forming because you can't move that leg. So that's another big thing that, you know, some people, some people are probably not going to be keen on. Yeah. And Tom last year, when I had him on my podcast, when we were interviewing his father, Merv, he went into some detail about it from 12 months ago and it hasn't been published yet. And it will be published hopefully in the next three to four months. And I'm going to have Tom on. But he said at the time, 50% of people that are coming in with ACL ruptures seem to be a good candidate. So one in two. Mm. Um, and he's now... That what's, what's interesting in my mind is now that we've got this data that's Tom that Tom's collected over this period of time, he started to actually grade the type of ACL rupture from minimally displaced, moderately, severely to then make a decision who is going to be a candidate based off what the MRI looks like to see whether they should go for the bracing or not. Because some of them just aren't going to heal or they're going to have a a poor healing response. It's going to be detensioned um, because the ends of the ACL or where it's been ruptured are just too far away from each other Mm. to get adequate healing. So I think it's going to be interesting what happens in the next decade because the other thing that I want to question is, how long do we have to brace to see these changes going forward when a lot of these people are actually going to be maybe a spontaneous healer with a minimally displaced ACL rupture? Mm, mm. So, you know, do we need to stay 
in a, such a strict bracing protocol for six weeks or is it actually four or where is this going to go? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I've been thinking the same thing. Um, even chatting to to Kieran Richardson about this as well and he sort of uh, he sort of mentioned that he gets some of his his patients to do different sort of bracing procedures like but the main thing probably is avoiding that complete extension um but I, I definitely think there's going to be some teasing out of of that bracing protocol like hey yeah. what if we do a, a you know randomized control trial of, of that sort of four to six weeks or whatever it is versus 12 weeks and and you know even shorter ones like what if we can just chuck it in brace for for the first two weeks and then you know maybe just something to avoid that last part of extension for another couple of weeks so yeah i i I agree because obviously we want to have the smallest impact as possible in terms of you know we want to reduce the the those negative effects of going in the brace which is obviously you're gonna have some some strength loss some muscle atrophy potentially some some stiffness as well that was something that i had a lot of like i was a lot of people voiced concerns about sort of having the the knee stiffen up and you're not be able to get that moving again properly afterwards which for my n of one didn't happen at all like she was she was really good her knee came back nicely but i do understand that a few people probably have a bit of knee stiffness afterwards um but yeah if we can if we can sort of theoretically reduce that time down and, and still get a really good outcome. I think that's probably where, yeah, where some of the future research will definitely go. And it maybe is time, but also the varying degrees of flexion. So yeah. is it is it 90? Do we have to start at 90? Maybe we start a little bit lower down at say 75 or 60 or 50 or who, who knows what the actual, mm. you know, guidelines are going to be in a decade, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I think it's phenomenal research because Mm. it's great for those populations that are in remote areas that don't have access to um, healthcare. They don't have access to surgeons, et cetera, or even Tom mentioned it in the podcast last year, places like Fiji, Mm. where there's a lot of people that are playing sport over there. That's a change of direction sport, like rugby or touch or something like that. And there's a lot of people walking around over there with ACL deficient knees because they weren't appropriately managed after they did it. And I don't think they even have an MRI in Nandi. Mm. Is it Nadi or Nandi? Um, the capital, I think it is. Yeah. Anyway, so the idea is we, with someone like that, we could always go for the wait and see option, put them in a brace, put, put them on the anticoagulants. You get a nurse to do that over there. Mm. And then you play the waiting game. You do your 12 weeks, you come out, how do we know if it's healed or not over there <laughs> considering they don't have an MRI? Maybe they do now. Um, I'm not sure, but in an ideal world, you'd still have the MRI data to see whether it has healed. Mm. So. Yeah. I, so many, so many exciting opportunities with it, I think as well. And just, just avoiding some of those like surgeries. I've got a couple of people at the moment and one of, one of the guys is, is a little bit older and he's had, He's had massive DVTs after his surgery, and like he, his post, his sort of post-surgery story is just, yeah, it's it's terrible. He's just struggling. He's months down the track. He can't straighten his knee properly. He's, you know, struggling with what he has a physical job. He's struggling with that. He's got pain and swelling still. So, you know, if we can avoid some of those situations, I think that's it's super exciting for for people to give them those options. What will be interesting as well is if you have a minimally injured ACL where it's a complete rupture, it's not displaced, it's not a long way from each other in terms of the ends, you know, should you go for bracing or do you just try and let it spontaneously heal, you know? Mm. So there's there's so many areas of research that people are going to delve into in the next decade. Yeah, um, I so- think I don't, I don't even... Oh, this could be completely wrong because I haven't seen any of the, the evidence on this, but I, I understand that the quality of the heel might be better in general from the bracing protocol in yeah. terms of the, versus some of the the outcomes that were that were in the the Canoon trial. And I know talking to to um, to surgeons about it, they, I guess they say that you know that quality is super potentially very important so if it's if it's healed but it's still quite a lax ligament and that doesn't stiffen up over time 
it's probably not a lot better than than just being ACL deficient. And obviously, you can still get by with that with good exercise rehab for some people. But if you want a high quality ACL in there, then um, then possibly the the protocol you know might show to be superior for that. But obviously, that's that's completely hypothetical at this stage. Have you heard yeah, similar and, stuff? Yeah, and look, Tom's said this to me, and he said that on the podcast last year. Not everyone is going to be a candidate for this bracing protocol. Mm -hmm. We still need surgeons. Mm -hmm. And you can always play the, the go with the wait and see option of try the brace if it's a moderate or minimally um, injured ACL. And if it doesn't heal, you can always go back and yep. get surgery. There's no, the only thing you're really losing is time and the pain of dealing with a brace for a mm -hmm. period of time. So, we still need surgeons. Surgeons play a really big part. So we're not saying that surgery is not effective. It's still something that we can use. But I think people get pushed into surgery way too early. Yeah, 100%. That's a really good point to make too, mate, because uh, I think people assume that, yeah, especially with some of the content that I've put out, that I'm really anti-surgery. Not at all. I think some people definitely benefit from surgery compared to them not having surgery. But it's more making sure that they they are informed with their decision because I've had lots of people contact me and go, "Oh, I wish I knew about this when I had you know before I had mine done." Just make sure people are informed; they know about their their choices, and if they want to, then probably exploring conservative or exercise based rehab before going to surgery, and that's you know that has been shown to not produce inferior results. If if anything, it might be better off going. You might be better off going into surgery having done a rehab or a prehab, whatever you want to call it, some good high quality exercise based um, management going in, then having your surgery, you're not going to be, you're not going to be sort of hamstrung in any way other than, as you said, that, that time commitment. Because some surgeons still and have in the past mentioned to patients that having an accelerated ACL surgery may be consistent with reducing the incidence of future meniscal tears compared with delaying surgery. Now you said that that isn't the case. Mm -hmm. um, when I asked you that question, why and what research do we have? Question. Um, so I'll, I'll, we'll go straight to the, to the research in this one. So it was Eckers in 2020, Eckers et al. found that there was no good evidence that ACL reconstruction reduces the chances of uh, further meniscal damage compared to um, compared to non-surgery. Non so it's one of those ones that there's just, theoretically, it, it could change in the future. Maybe we will find some good evidence that it, it, it does, but so far, based on the evidence, there just isn't that, that evidence to support the fact that yeah, you're going to have an ACL reconstruction done and it's going to reduce the chances of, of further meniscal damage. The theory is that because you've got increased movement in the knee without having that ACL there, that that movement will lead to, to further uh, meniscal tears. And that, you know, as a theory sounds, you know, sounds plausible, but there just isn't the evidence to suggest that actually going and having that reconstruction does actually reduce those, those further um, meniscal tears. I think there was, a, there was actually a paper out on this quite re recently that I haven't actually gone through in detail yet, but once again, seems to be showing similar stuff. Yeah. And segueing from there to the question when I asked, does surgery for ACL ruptures reduce the incidence or severity of osteoarthritic change? Mm compared with no surgery in the future and you said no yeah um and from what i've read the frobel at at al 2013 and the lee at al 2019 are the yep. two studies that we have that are really indicative of that no that you gave yeah um and have you got anything to add there and why yeah look it, it's it's pretty. I think I feel more confident in that evidence, to be honest. I think with the the Eckers one, they just the 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 um, review really said that they just don't have high quality evidence. But I think the the evidence there is a lot of evidence around arthritis risk, and it's it's pretty clear that ACL reconstruction does not reduce your chances of getting arthritis, both. Um, patellofemoral and tibiofemoral. So the, the actual knee joint, the hinge joint there, 
um, it doesn't reduce the chances in there, but it possibly increases your chances, particularly in the patellofemoral joint, your kneecap joint. Actually, that that further trauma, well, the theory is that having that further trauma, especially potentially soon after your initial trauma. So you have the ACL rupture, it's a trauma to the knee, you get this big inflammatory response. Um, inflammation seems to be particularly related to the development of osteoarthritis. Um, and you, you then go soon afterwards and have a further trauma to the knee, they're drilling the bone, et cetera. And that sort of continuation of the, the inflammatory response could be why we don't see a reduction in the rates of arthritis and we, we're possibly actually seeing an, an increase, a slight increase in, in chances of arthritis afterwards. So I, I think based on the current evidence, we can pr be pretty confident saying that ACL reconstruction does not reduce your chances of uh, further osteoarthritis. Well done, mate. That was phenomenally answered. And we touched on the fact that you kind of mentioned it there that the ACL surgery is actually further trauma or injury per se to the knee after that initial incident or injury that they had if when they ruptured it. Just dive into that because you kind of touched on it then because a lot of people think that just going in for the surgery, it's not a big deal. Mm. Just going in, doing the surgery, away you go. But in theory, it actually is another trauma. Yeah, yeah, and and it's quite a big trauma. I mean, if if you want to have a look at it, just Google ACL yeah, yeah. Um, surgery and have a look at what they do. But yeah, they do. They, you've got to you got to harvest the 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 new ligament, the tendon. So depending on where they get it from, the hamstrings or the the patella, and often they'll be taking it. If it's patella, they might take out a bit of bone from your patella. Um, and where it attaches onto the tib. So you've got this bone patella bone graft. So you take, you're take cutting bone there. When you drill it in and put it in place, there's another drilling of that. So there's there's a, a massive sort of trauma to the knee. It's not just a minor surgery. It's, you know, on the scale of surgeries, you're sure it might be reasonably minor, but it's, it's a fairly big trauma. And, you know, as you know, Andrew, when you come out of it, there's often heaps of swelling and pain for a long time, which is indicative of that sort of inflammatory process. So, it, yeah, it's, it, it, we obviously don't have the, the high quality evidence to show that is definitely what leads to, to the arthritis, but, you know, it, it fits in, in with existing research on arthritis that it's definitely linked to inflammation. Yeah, and I think there's this notion out there as well. If you do your knee, you have the surgery and you're going to get back to your sport mm. and you're going to get back to your pre-injury level of sport as well. And some of the research just does not back that up at all. Mm. You know, the Arden et al. 2014 and Phil Bain et al. in 2019 said the one third of young individuals have a second ACL rupture and 20% a third rupture within two to nine years after revision. And that second ACL injury, 90% of them have meniscal injuries. Mm. So, and the other thing is revision is associated with more pain and symptoms, yeah. reduced function, inactivity, higher rates of OA, which is osteoarthritic change, um, compared with the first ACL surgery. And the return to sport numbers from those two reviews, 55% return to competitive sport and 65% return to pre-injury level of sport, which mm. is not that great, really. No. So this is why this new research that Tom's doing and the fact that we can potentially push more towards these um, non-operative measures for ACL ruptures, maybe that is going to be a good thing going forward in terms of those return rates because the website at our one, mate, that you put up on your, I didn't know about that one until you put it up on your Instagram, the website at our 2022, the one about the AFL players. Oh yeah. Yeah. Unreal really stats. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, it was yeah, 90, yeah. 96% of non-pro male AFL players expected to return to AFL and 92 mm. expected to return to their pre-injury level. However, return at any level was 35% at 12 months and 78% between two to five years and 64% overall returned to the same or a higher level after this surgery. Mm. And the biggest reason why they didn't return is because of the fear of re-injury. I just found that fascinating. That is such a good study. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. I think that's it's fairly consistent across different sports as well. That mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's like the driving stats, isn't it? Like, isn't ninety percent of people think they're in the top ten percent of drivers or something? But you, <laughs> the expectations yeah. are just way out of proportion. Unfortunately, like everyone thinks that they, if they get the surgery, they're going to be that those people that return back to their sport. But 
you've just got to be I think this is this is I guess what I'm most passionate about is informing people with the with the evidence so they can make that informed decision both for their knee short term both return to sport but also their long term knee health because if they just think yep go have the surgery they fixed my knee in inverted commas and I can yeah. go back and play sport exactly how it was before and I'm not going to get arthritis or or meniscus damage because he's fixed my knee or she's fixed my knee um, I, I think it's just really important to let people know, ideally before the surgery, that you know that's that's just not supported by the evidence. The evidence would suggest that you've got these sort of chances, and just lay it out for them because that way they can go, oh wow, look, I'm happy to still go ahead with the surgery. I'm happy to take those odds, or actually, you know what, I wouldn't mind exploring other options first. And if that's not working, then I can go and have that surgery done. Um, because yeah, I, I think that point around the the revision surgeries is so worth emphasizing i heard steph philbay talking about this on a podcast recently and just saying that that the the revision surgery is is really associated with poor outcomes especially for long-term knee health so you know if it is that you you have to go through that that rehab process and then and at the end of it you're not happy you go and have that surgery done rather than go and have the surgery done you know, maybe go back to playing sport too soon, re-rupture it, and then you're in a you're in a really tricky position because you can't go and opt for non-surgical. Um, you can't go and opt for non-surgical and try and let that ACL heal at least. You can still go for non-surgical, but either way, it's probably not going to lead to good outcomes. Yeah, so I think, I think really, really informing people of of that information up front is yeah, is so important. And I think that is the moral of the story here is patients deserve to be informed. Mm. And they shouldn't be pushed. I've got a little story about this. So 2013, 14, I worked at the North Sydney Orthopedic Group, the MARTA Clinic Physiotherapy. And I had, it was she was about 50 from memory. She'd done her ACL, skiing. All she wanted to do was go back to walking, a bit of gym here and there and play some tennis. She had an objecti- objectively quite stable knee. Mm. However, I proposed the idea of not having surgery and there are other options. You don't have to, no one's holding a gun to your head and a quite notable surgeon in Sydney, but also worldwide one day came steaming in to the physio clinic one afternoon after she'd seen this patient for her second consult with this surgeon. I won't say he or her, um, and he was, she was steaming, absolutely fuming, comes in and says, where's Andrew Wild? Where is he? I'm like, yeah, I'm over here. And came over and absolutely tore me to shreds. How dare you undermine me? You can't tell someone what they should do with their knee. They should be told by me. I'm the one that makes the decision, blah, 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 blah. And in the end, she didn't have the surgery because she stuck to her guns. And she had a really good result. She had no instability. She was technically probably a copa. Um, she had, and for the listeners out there, the copa's guidelines, stable knee objectively, no giving way, hop tests above 80%. The COS ADLS, 80% plus, and the self-reported global knee function rating scale above 60. Um, she ticked off all those boxes and was doing really well. And she didn't have any issues. And I, I just still remember it because I was in, it was one of those clinics as well, mate, that had, it was just beds up either side, all curtains. There were heaps of other people there, other patients. And I just got absolutely torn to shreds. Wow. And after it, I went and had a chat with this surgeon and just said that it was unprofessional. It didn't need to happen like that. Yeah. But it just, it's an example of this, in the surgical world, sometimes it is too black and white. You either need surgery or you you need it now or you need it very soon. So anyway, there, there's do you, a little Do you reckon there was something, you know, because was, was she just upset because she wanted the best outcome for the patient or do you think there could, could have been some other issues at play there? Uh, I, I think genuinely like being deep, undermined. Deep, deep, deep down, I think that, this surgeon is a good surgeon. Don't get me wrong. Mm. Mm. Very good surgeon. However, 
I think that at the time it, there was a uh, rationale or narrative around having surgery was the go. It was what you needed. Everyone needed it. Mm. So I think that this patient had been pushed a little bit into a little bit too early into surgery potentially and didn't have all of the, the necessary information that I did give her after she'd seen the surgery. Mm. But there are, there are other options. Mm. Now I've probably fumbled over my words a little bit there and bumbled over my words a bit there. Cause I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure I didn't say any names. Yeah. Um, but it, it was a, a real uh, pivotal moment in my career <laughs> in a Absolutely. way, because it was the first patient that I ever had with an ACL. And I was about two years out of uni with an ACL that didn't have surgery and she had yeah. a good result. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's a, a good way to f- sort of, I guess, frame things in the future. You can always tell people, Hey, I've actually had this person and they had a really good outcome not having had surgery. So that's, that's really good first experience with an ACL. Yeah, for sure. Mate, anything else you wanted to add? Cause I know you love this stuff. You were smashing it at the end of last year. Whoa, big question there, mate. Um, for me, yeah, for me that I guess that the main thing that I, I mean, I love doing with with people as I was saying to you in the in the intro is is just guiding them and giving them all of that information rather than being too strong on any particular outcome. And I think that's that's probably something that's missing from our system. It's like you go and see, and and I try to always give people all of the the information, not saying you have to do this, you have to do that, because in general. Um, you go, you know that everyone's going to have their their sort of their own biases and their their professional blinkers on. So you go and see a surgeon, you're likely to to go under the knife. You go and see a physio, they maybe they're going to recommend you you do rehab. And I I got into a bit of a an online debate with someone. Some some physio was sort of having a go at me, saying, "No, you should be telling you know telling patients what to do. Like, why do you think people come and see you just to be given information?" I'm like, well. Yes, <laughs> I think there does need to be someone who who people can trust to go and see and be given all of the information so that they can actually make a decision for themselves rather than this like patriarchal, like I'm telling you what you need to do with your knee because they're not the ones who, you know, the, the person is not the person who, who's telling the person what to do. The surgeon or the, the physio is not the one who's got to live with those the, that knee and those consequences for the rest of their life. It's the the person has to, the, the patient has to do that and they need to be, you know, comfortable that they made an informed decision with as much information, up-to-date, good quality information that they can possibly get at that time. And, you know, like some people, obviously, they do want a recommendation. And once you've gone through all that information, you've gone through all of their situation, what they want to get back to, then then absolutely, yeah, happy to, to always make recommendations. But I think providing people with all that information is, is so important. And probably another point worth emphasizing is sometimes you've got to have tough conversations with people and 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 i guess way up like is what's more important to you is it is it getting back to playing you know that you know footy or soccer or, or whatever your sport is and, and just letting them know there there is an inherent risk going back to to cutting pivoting sports there is going to be some risk there um balance that up versus long-term knee health and and some people are happy going you know what like I've had enough of playing volleyball. I'm in my 30s or 40s. I've, I've kind of, you know, I've done my dash there. I'd, I'd actually rather had a lady recently from the US who said, look, I'd rather actually, you know, go back to surfing. Like surfing, obviously still a bit of strain on the knee, but that was something that was probably more important to her. She was like, look, I actually don't necessarily want to go back to playing volleyball. I want to, I want to enjoy my life, enjoy my kids, go, you know, go surfing, be active and try to reduce the chances of, of, you know, getting any post-traumatic arthritis. So therefore trying to reduce those subsequent knee injuries. So I think having those sorts of conversations with people, it can be tough, like informing people that they've now got an increased chance of or risk of arthritis. Um, but yeah, I think empowering people is is so important to do. Well said, mate. Let's leave it there. That was phenomenal. Awesome, mate. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. No worries. My pleasure. I had to uh, get you back for you having me on me being on your podcast at the end of last year. How's that podcast going? 
Yeah, good, good. Um, loving getting getting different people on there. It, it's such a like selfishly, it's such a good way to learn. Oh, I'm 100%. sure you probably found the same thing. It's yeah, it's awesome, and um, it's it's also just nice having having those conversations, building relationships with with different people, and it's it's a good resource to share with patients as well. Like if you've got an expert from an area and you can share that with with people, it's yeah, it's really nice. It's digestible. So yeah, I'm enjoying it, mate. For sure. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's a it's a great way to learn because you get thrown under the bus. Like all of this stuff, I went back and had a look at all of the Instagram posts that you were putting up and I went back mm. through the the research articles that you had quoted and I've done a lot of work on it in the last two or three days just because I wanted to be prepared. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it kind of just forces you to do a little bit of study. It um, does. Yeah. yeah. It's it's really good. It's really good from that perspective. It's also um, good just for content, as you said, to then send patients. Exactly. You know, like I've I've done a couple of running ones with Ellie Pashley and I get a heap of runners and they're great to those two podcasts are great to send to the runners. Because mm. then you've got someone that's gone to the Olympics saying the same things that I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So they may be more likely to listen to the her than me um so yeah I, I regularly do that send some of my podcasts or even yours or someone else's podcasts that are relevant to that client yeah it's good and it, look it can be really good just sending other people's as well because i think it, it's nice to go hey this is not just me telling you this information here's someone else talking about it as well so yeah i'm, I'm often referring like your podcast and other people's podcasts and, and those sorts of things so yeah definitely more podcasts out there is a good thing, I reckon, especially on like so. <laughs> I remember Adam Meekins going on about how he hated how many physio podcasts there were out there, but I love it. I think it's it's nice you can go through and, and find they've all got different sort of perspectives and ways of telling stories. But it's, I mean, for physios and healthcare professionals, it's such a great resource to to stay up to date and 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 get a bit of a summary of the evidence. And then if you you know. If, for example, I remember listening to to a few podcasts on, by Steph Philbay. They, I, I find them fascinating on ACL stuff. And then you can then she'll she'll mention a whole bunch of papers, and you can dive in and, and start to read those papers because it can be can be overwhelming. Like if you just type in ACL <laughs> ACL on PubMed, for example, you're going to get so many hits. And just knowing where to where to start with that can be can be so tough. So would highly recommend um, listening to some of her podcasts for sure. I've just pulled up actually, this is a, a study that I meant to mention before. Um, one of Steph's papers, Steph Philbay, um, early ACL reconstruction is required to prevent additional knee injury and misconception not supported by high quality evidence. In And that is from 2019. So that was a really good one looking at that sort of the ideas around further meniscal damage, um, and also arthritis. So really sort of looking in depth at some of the research around that. And it's a nice place to start because it's got, it refers to some of those other papers like the Eckers paper, et cetera, which, which dived into the, into the research and yeah, really sort of is a nice one to even potentially share with, with patients too, because that's often in, in my experience anyway, some of the things that they are really concerned about, like, yes, it's return to sport, but once you sort of letting them know about that, the potential long-term implications, Hey, they, they want to, they want to reduce their chances of further injuries and, and um, if possible chances of, of arthritis as well. Yeah, for sure. And for the listeners out there that want to learn more about this, Jeff has a million posts on all this stuff at the end of last year end of 2022 from about october through to december he went berserk and was yeah. posting probably every second day about acl so <laughs> um he's also pinned an acl um what to do if you have ruptured your acl pinned post at the top of your yeah. instagram i saw today yeah so there's plenty of great information out there so keep up the great work jeff thanks so much andrew appreciate it mate no worries. Thanks again for coming on. And as usual, guys, stay strong.